February 16, 1944, dawn. Waves of Hellcat fighters speed toward Truck Atoll. Their mission? Destroy enemy shipping in the highly defended Japanese stronghold. 25-year-old Lieutenant J.G. Alex Vrashu flies with a division of 12 Hellcats from the aircraft carrier Intrepid. This was a mission that had us going against an enemy that we weren't certain of, but we, we felt confident. And I guess that's what a fighter pilot's supposed to be, be confident or, or he can't do his job. Truck Atoll in the Caroline Islands is Japan's main anchorage in the South Pacific. They've been fortifying the Atoll with port facilities and runways since the end of World War I. Truck was billed as almost impregnable. Uh, their version of, uh, of Gibraltar or Pearl Harbor. And the propaganda was very strong that truck would be an incredibly tough fight. The barrier reefs that surround truck put the atoll out of range of the battleship's big guns. The only way in is by air. 72 Hellcats from six carrier air wings will swarm in to eliminate the enemy fighters. This was going to be an attack of annihilation. So what you're seeing with the truck raid is a systematic approach to taking a substantial shore bash and, and reducing it to nothingness. Pure fighter sweeps are rare. Hellcat pilots are anxious for a raid unencumbered with bomber escort. It was the first time we didn't have to escort, and we were just pure fighter, we call ourselves. And as we got closer and closer to it, and being in a plane that we knew we could handle, we, I'll tell you, quite honestly, we were looking forward to it. Brashu and his wingman, Lou Little, bring up the rear of their 12-plane formation. As they fly the 90 miles from their carrier, they stay low to avoid enemy radar. Approaching the atoll, they climb to 13,000 feet. The higher altitude gives them better visibility and positions them for diving attacks. You want to have an altitude advantage because altitude can be translated into airspeed with a dive. The enemy has scrambled fighters. The Americans haven't spotted them yet. Brashu's flight noses over to start its strafing run on the enemy airstrip. The first 10 had already started their dive going down, and we were just preparing to, but I just took a look around back, looked back over my shoulder, and that's when my mind was quickly changed. There they are, 3,000 feet above a swarm of Japanese Zeros, closing fast from 7 o'clock. Vrashu radios the other Hellcats, but they're already diving. He must stay and fight. I couldn't continue, because then I'd have a stream of Zeros right behind us while we were going down. Vrashu and Little are here. The other Hellcats are here, diving. The Zeros attacking from above. If Brashu dives, the Zeros will be on his and the squadron's six o'clock. Perfect attack position. His only option is to turn sharply into the enemy, minimizing his cross section and reducing his time in the Zeros' gun sights. Brashu and Little pull a hard left turn and focus on the lead Zero. He was already starting to shoot. I could see the twinkle of the guns. So I headed towards him and made a burst, a fast burst, just to discourage him. And he stopped his run and just kept going down. They had a habit that they weren't afraid to attack, but once they were countered, they'd dive down for the water. The first zero darts away. But immediately, another swings around on Vrashu's tail. The Americans counter by pulling up into a steep chandel. They're relying on the Hellcat's superior power, large wing area, and strong airframe to push them through the high G maneuver and turn the tables on the zero. The chandel maneuver, it's basically a maneuver to try and point your aircraft in another direction in a fairly quick method. Instead of just doing a level turn, actually pitch your nose up high, roll over on a wing, and now you can use 
gravity or what we like to call God's G to help you out in the turn, allow you to pull your nose around faster and point in the other direction. The enemy cranks over hard, trying to stay behind the Americans. But the Zero can't hack the severe turn. He stalls. The Hellcats roll over and get behind the falling Zero. They're primed for the kill. But more Zeros speed in from above. I had ideas to try to follow him, but there were still some planes above me. I had to get them out of, the, out of my back. He doesn't want to be fighting anybody that can be sitting up on a perch 2,000 feet above him who can then instantly dive down, pick up energy, and now have an advantage on him on a turn. So he wants to bring the whole fight down low if possible, to beat everybody down to the same state. Vrashu and Little must neutralize the enemy's numerical and altitude advantage. They snap into a classic defensive maneuver, the thatch weave. In the thatch weave, the two Hellcats swing back and forth, providing mutual support and protection. Frustrated by their inability to score decisive hits, the Japanese move down to the Hellcats' altitude. It's a fatal mistake. The Americans break their defensive formation and seize the advantage. Up until that time, we were purely defensive. Once they came down to our level, or below, then we were able then to go on the offense. The Americans have skillfully turned the tables. Now the Zeros are vulnerable to the powerful and highly maneuverable Hellcats. What ensues is the dogfight equivalent of a brawl. And the winner determined by who can line up the first burst. Vrashu turns hard on an attacking Zero. The Japanese pilot dives to escape. One of the favorite Japanese techniques, if engaged and in a defensive position, was to try to dive away and try to head for the water. The technique worked with the Wildcat, but not with the Hellcat. Once he caught on fire, OK, he's gone down. You're looking for another one. You just go from one to the other and hope you get a dozen of them. Vrashu draws a bead on a second zero. The enemy tries to dive away, but the Hellcat easily catches him. It's Vrashu's second kill of the day. Then he spots a roof, a float plane version of a zero. Again, the enemy dives away. Vrashu is relentless. His job is to sweep the enemy from the sky. And once I got on their tail, I didn't let go. Kill number three. Vrashu spots another zero at 12 o'clock low. I started to try to get in position, but he wouldn't let me. He kept ducking into a cloud. The Zero is running from cloud to cloud, so Vrashu calls on a basic dogfighting tactic. I'm not going to let the SOB get away. So I just pulled up and kept looking for him while he was ducking in and out and got in position to where I figured he couldn't see me. I pulled up into the sun and waited until I got a good shot. And I came down on him from 5 o'clock. I don't think he even knew what hit him. Vrashu's 50 caliber armor-piercing rounds slice into the Zero's wing tank and cockpit. Vrashu's fourth kill of the day plummets in a flaming spiral. The American fighter sweep continues throughout the day turning the skies above truck into a swirling vortex of gunfire and flame. There are loose fights all over the place. They were those planes going down one every 30 seconds. This was a wild dogfight, a wild one. The Americans are unyielding. The fierce combat costs the Japanese 130 planes in the air and another 74 on the ground. 